If you listen to what a lot of the so-called personal brand experts or personal brand strategists are saying, they'll lead you to believe that personal brand is guaranteed to everyone. And that couldn't be further from the truth. When you take good stewardship of your narrative and you really get good at telling your story, you'll draw more people in. Just kind of preserve a legacy of a guy that was there at the start who went a generation in, maybe a generation plus, and set up a few people for their positive futures. Since 2006, J.D. Gershman has been in the forefront of the LinkedIn conversation, one of the world's first independent LinkedIn consultants and a pioneer in LinkedIn education. J.D. serves ambitious professionals striving to make their mark in the digital age. As a speaker, facilitator, writer, and media producer, he draws upon his diverse academic background, a fusion of psychology, neuroscience, and the humanities, and the improvisation skills he honed at Chicago's famed Second City to bridge the knowledge gap that exists between business people and the online world. Known as the LinkedIn Style Guide, JD is widely regarded as a leader in personal branding, social networking, and social entrepreneurship and is blazing a trail as one of the most original personalities in the leadership development arena. Thank you so much, JD, for being here today. It is such a pleasure to have you. And I would love for you to really tap into your journey as a pioneer in LinkedIn education since 2006, and you've witnessed so much of the evolution of digital networking. What are some of the key shifts that you think are happening right now in the digital age. Well, first off, Dr. Carolyn, I can't begin any podcast appearance without saying thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's a Absolutely. pleasure. And the, and the time that has led up to our, our, our little taping here has been anticipatory. I'm glad to be with you. And, you know, I never thought my story would be of interest to anyone. And certainly it wasn't in the early going of, of what I do today because a lot had to evolve before I could talk of what I do as a career and a business model. And fortunately, things played out very well. I, I'm an early adopter of LinkedIn, and I leveraged that early adoption to create breakthrough moments for my clients and students. And my story has really kind of come front and center because when I started on the path, I had no identity in the business universe. I was kind of meandering around as a professional. I was in marketing. And I was looking for work in website development, copywriting, SEO marketing. And these were big deals back then. They still are. But okay. back then, it was easier to achieve a Google standing in a search other than just for your name. So people were really spending on positioning themselves for search. Nowadays, it's more about positioning themselves to get noticed. And my work has evolved as my story has evolved. I've really taken good stewardship of my narrative and go out there very precisely and very carefully as someone who can work with folks on a very immersive way to develop a LinkedIn presence that tees them up for business or career opportunities. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think a lot of people just when it comes to how they present themselves on LinkedIn can get a little murky. They don't always know how to present themselves, the personal branding, how that intersection of everything. And I know part of for you as the LinkedIn style guide, what do you consider the most misconceptions when it comes to personal branding on LinkedIn? What do you think is the traps for personal identity? I think if you listen to what a lot of the so-called personal brand experts or personal brand strategists are saying, they'll lead you to believe that personal brand is guaranteed to everyone. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It's challenging to build a personal brand. It's a day-to-day -day effort. And it's not guaranteed for anyone. It takes work, it takes rigorous study, it takes eyes on screen, and really kind of thinking about who you are in the business universe, what I call metacognition, meta-thinking about what's your place in professional society, what is the value you truly offer, and how does one gain context for themselves as a brand? So I think the misconception about branding is that everyone, although entitled to it, doesn't necessarily achieve it. That's so true. Because I think a lot of times people will go to personal branding strategists and try to figure out what they are doing in this world. And I think part of just being a leader in personal branding yourself, what do you think is that intersection with authenticity and personal branding showing up just as we are? It's where you move beyond the logo and your mm -hmm. graphics and you really exhibit good form 
in everything you do. You develop this sense of personal style, a mode of expression that characterizes you, makes you distinctive, and gives you a kind of a sophisticated and elegant air. And I think that's what's lacking in a lot of business conversation is everybody is kind of bypassing all of this and moving right into a cell. And nobody wants to be sold. Nobody is buying anything in the absence of trust. So you really have to work on that trust piece. That's very true. And I think that is missed a lot where it is just, okay, I'm going to sell. I'll connect with somebody on LinkedIn and they immediately in my inbox, I'm getting sold to. I'm like, I don't even know who you are yet, but you're right. It is building that trust. And a lot of times it is just really understanding the psychology behind it, how we can really just connect with people and be open. And I know a lot of your background has to do with psychology, neuroscience. How do you really intertwine that with the work you do now for LinkedIn and just your clients? Well, now you're speaking my language, Dr. Carol, and it really is an everyday application. Applied neuroscience, social psychology, these are terms that I kind of liberally use to really give myself a competitive advantage because I do speak to the psychology. I speak of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, incentivizing people to use the site. Why are we on this site in the first place? Well, LinkedIn is very unique in the social media world because it's around the business conversation and the pursuit of revenue, the pursuit of monetary gain, which separates us from the animal. Yeah. You don't see animals transacting with other animals. You, you no. see it's a fight for survival. Yeah. But really the psychological piece the intellectual and emotional centers of the brain that are activated when we perceive reward, when we move in the direction of an outcome, a desired outcome. Mm -hmm. That's what I like to focus my practice on and informing my clients and students as to the right way to do that, to not offend anyone, to appeal to their sensibilities and just not ram a sales pitch down their throats. That's true, because just like a lot of us have been just sold to constantly where we're not really understanding what does the person want? What is the motivation behind even connecting with somebody? And I know that's what you teach and you preach as well and being able to help them navigate the motivation both internally and externally and how that really can foster that growth for business, but also really connecting with people. Because I think that has been a big missing link for a lot of people online, just from conversations I've had. We had a conversation briefly about it as well. But what do you think is that trend moving forward to really connect? Do you see a trend moving towards more of that connection piece versus selling piece right away? Well, trends emerge and sometimes they kind of dissolve into the background. For a trend to really be considered a trend, it's got to stick for a while and almost become a best practice. And as we sit here and tape, yeah. I don't believe we're at a point where best practices have really changed or have added on. But we do see a lot of people orbiting around certain processes and functionalities to try to gain favor with clients and students and employers on LinkedIn. The emergence of the creator economy, which is at war with the attention economy. You see a tremendous amount of people now producing original content and distributing it across multiple platforms to try to gain an edge and try to cut through that proverbial clutter. But when I look at recent history as we sit here today, the mm -hmm. pandemic is really the greatest inflection point in, I would say, in the 2020s. And that's how we kicked off the decade, for gosh sakes, with a global health crisis. So what have we learned? We saw a lot of survival behaviors, a lot of people selling out of desperation, a lot of people just abandoning a lot of what we would call relationship development and moving right into, again, a sales conversation. So backing up organic growth is what really drives results on LinkedIn. That's what I favor. That's how I advocate the use of my own LinkedIn work. And I think when you really approach people from a place of collaboration and co-creation and you genuinely look to build relationships, that A word, authenticity, Dr. Carolyn. But at the same time, to kind of round out my answer, we are seeing the emergence of AI technologies and machine generated content. So there's this kind of authenticity lost piece. Yeah. Uh, automation is displacing what we thought of as authenticity. In fact, uh, automation is the antithesis of okay. authenticity. Say that 10 times real fast. <laughs> Not going to try. <laughs> but you're absolutely right because there is so much more AI now. People are using that on a regular basis and you might notice when content is created AI versus actual human being and 
that can really hold us back in a lot of ways of really getting to know somebody, especially on the online space, because you're not really having that communication right away. You're just seeing the words or a video or something. You're not actually having that back and forth conversation where people can just genuinely be who they are and have that space to co-create, collaborate, and do those things. And I'm just curious because I know that's where you started on LinkedIn. What did that process look like get, even getting on LinkedIn? How did you even get about to where you are today when it comes to you that? Mean, you mean how did the whole damn thing happen, huh? Basically. Yes, <laughs> yes please. <laughs> I mean, there's so many dots to connect here, but yeah. I discovered LinkedIn and I would have discovered it anyway back in the holiday season of 2006. Mm -hmm. I leaned into a couple of colleagues who were looking at a website and I asked them what you would ask them. Yes. What are you looking at? Yeah. And they told me it was LinkedIn and I had had limited exposure to social media. Remember MySpace? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually had a MySpace account, didn't do anything with it. I was on Facebook, kind of dabbling with it. But yeah. when I arrived at the shores of LinkedIn, something happened. The way that I'm hardwired, I took to it immediately. I went home that night, created my account, started to position myself for opportunities in my marketing business. I was a marketing consultant, but we were also at the headwaters of a recession. So I'm not sure that that was the best time to go all in on a social media business at the start of a recession, a global recession. But I took a leap of faith and within a few weeks of creating my LinkedIn account, mm -hmm. I was a LinkedIn consultant mm -hmm. and I never shut up about it. I loved the site. I saw its potential right away. I'm highly intuitive when it comes to stuff like this, as I have learned. And I was the guy that did the deep dive and was bringing it up at networking events and mm -hmm. then getting asked to speak at networking groups and going out locally here in my hometown of Chicago and doing programs with other businesses and just extolling the merits, the perceived mm -hmm. merits of LinkedIn, kind of opening people up to possibilities. Take a look at this thing. This could be really good for your business or company or job search. And back in the day, right. LinkedIn truly was that job search platform right up there with the careerbuilder.com and monster.com. More people needed jobs than were developing business. And along the way, more business development started to emerge and sales teams started to look at LinkedIn as a way to prospect and generate leads. Although I don't like the term lead generation, kind of a predatory term, but to obviously build their pipelines and their funnels. And it's crazy because now LinkedIn has changed so much since back in 2006, even just the last few years, I would say it's really changed. What have you noticed the most about how you utilize LinkedIn and how it has evolved just the last few years? I think it's become more visually compelling, a mm -hmm. high level of visual interest on the site. And LinkedIn has opened up its creator mode to people who are now using its internal channels of LinkedIn audio and LinkedIn live and LinkedIn newsletters and mm -hmm. all sorts of creator modalities to really get out there and express themselves. And that's where the importance of having a sense of style, a LinkedIn style comes in because now you're making this mental shift from a static network to mm -hmm. a dynamic community. And within this dynamic community lies your audience. So more and more people are interested in building an audience, a following. And that borrows a lot from some of the other social media platforms. And LinkedIn has become that interactive space now, that place to really build and manage a community. I have noticed that shift as well. And I think it's really blending what you're doing, that purpose and your passion to really be able to get out there in front of people having LinkedIn Live and communities and newsletters. I've just seen it more and more through my own community. I'm just like, wow, there's so much here. But I think that's the beautiful thing with the style and the personality and our authenticity and bridging everything and all your knowledge together to be able to help so many people really just stand in their power, being who they are. And I know you've done so many different things. You've also done improv. You use a lot of humor. How does that all intertwine with what you do today? People like to laugh, to have fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't take myself so seriously. I used to take myself very seriously. And certainly back in the day when I was new in the trade, companies didn't bring me in to do an act. They came in to help me generate revenue and educate their teams. Mm -hmm. And individuals retained me to write profiles that truly spoke to their value propositions and would put them in a position to develop and close new business. So 
what humor I used back in the day was kind of more of an aside, but now there is a place for humor and improv in business. And it's a signature piece for me. I like to have fun. Part of my brand is being accessible and responsive and receptive and humor plays into that. It's a defense mechanism for me growing up my whole life, but improv mm -hmm. a little bit of a different story because mm -hmm. you don't need to be funny to be able to improvise. And I see improv applied improv as a valuable cognitive framework in developing business and in putting ourselves forward as professionals. And I teach improv principles and my clients and students don't even know that they're on the receiving end of these principles because it really just comes down to how we extend conversations, keep them in play, keep important discussions in front of us and prioritize our minds in such a way where we don't sound canned. We don't sound automated. We don't sound machine generated, but right. we're really responding genuinely and authentically to what we're receiving, taking in and giving it back to support our conversation partner. So important. And it's just that conversation piece is so important with storytelling and the role of storytelling. And how do you think that intertwines with just these conversations we're having, what you have with your clients and all the conversations you've had throughout your life as well, but really that element of storytelling. How do you think that does play a huge part? Presence in the moment. Mm -hmm. When you take good stewardship of your narrative and you really get good at telling your story, you'll draw more people in. If yeah. the story is undeveloped, if you haven't curated your narrative thoughtfully, you're going to go out there kind of scattered. There'll be a disconnect. People won't take you seriously. They'll have trouble placing you and you won't be able to kind of take up residence in their psychic hierarchy. You won't be able to be placed. Mm -hmm. And I spoke about this in my TED talk back in 2015 about a, a personal brand that people see when we're right in front of them and they can make their judgments and evaluations based on our appearance, our mannerisms, our apparel. But when you're online, it's a different story. You have to challenge yourself to be more authentic and put yourself out there in a way where you can be taken at face value and you don't create confusion in the mind of those who receive you. That's so good. And, you know, I'm just like thinking about that because a lot of times, especially in the beginning of a business, you might not know what your narrative is or how to pitch yourself. And like, I struggled with that in the beginning. I'm like, well, how do I say what I'm doing? And it, it's confusing people and I do too many things. And I think when we are able to practice it and be able to just know what we're putting out there, it makes it very clear to people of, oh, okay, this is what this person does. I know exactly what they're putting out there. And it has to do with style. It has to do with the words, all of that intermixing with the psychology behind it and how people are perceiving us. But how we sometimes want to be perceived is not always how we're perceived. Have you seen that? Well, I'm sure you've seen this a lot, but the disconnect where you see people that they're putting their stuff out there, but there's not the validity behind what they're trying to accomplish the storytelling, the narrative, what have you seen out there basically? All the time, yeah. all the time, Dr. Carolyn. That's why I'm retained. I'm retained yeah. to fix that type of problem yeah. and make sure that the real life story matches what people see in the online world. Storytelling is the new marketing and we're under immense pressure now to be storytellers. And mm -hmm. it's hard to tell stories. What does that mean to people? I mean, do you start everything you say with once upon a time, there was me and I did this and now I'm doing this and I want to do this? Well, to a certain point, but to spin a good yarn and weave it into the business conversation is not easy. And there are storytelling coaches and... Mm -hmm narratologists and people who can assist you in, again, curating the best elements of that story and putting it out there, not just so you can tell a better story, but to sell the story. People are buying stories now. We want to know the background, the heritage, the lineage behind brands that we trust. That's so true. I'm like, I wish I had this conversation six years ago when I started my business because I could not tell stories. <laughs> I struggled at it because I'm like, well, how do I pitch myself? How do I put myself out there? And I think a lot of people listening that might be in that beginning stage do feel maybe overwhelmed because there's so much information out there. How do you differentiate yourself from everybody else? But I think it's looking at what are you good at? How can you convey the story? And it's not like, yes, you want to sell something, but I think it's being really true to yourself and how you want to yeah. help people and solve the problem. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're solving a problem 
that's been there, but now people are actually understanding how important it is. I think they're coming around to knowing storytelling is a key element, but it's how you brand yourself. It's how you're really in tune with who you are. And I think that goes back to the psychology aspect of who you are, what you want to convey, and really how to navigate that. Because a lot of times people are, from my experience and what I've heard from people, is they will want to sell something, but they're not solving a problem or it's not aligned with their audience. And it's getting really clear on that. And for you, what was your experience with getting very clear? Because I know it's transitioned over time and evolved, but what helped you get really clear on what problem you were solving? I really gave myself up to the transformational power of LinkedIn. Mm. I am not the same person that arrived at LinkedIn in 2006. I have witnessed how this site and these platforms have the ability to shape, manage, and guide perceptions. And I was all in on it. So for me, I went from someone that wasn't really clear on the value I provided, although I know I was a good egg and I was a smart cookie, yeah. and I knew that I could create value for those who retain me, but what yeah. was that? What was that value? What I was able to do, which I tried to lead by example with others on and off the platform, is to find that dominant aspect of value and really play to it and really approach it asymptotically. You're never going to get perfection. You're never going to really communicate the essence of your value to people in a way that is going to be completely satisfactory to you. But you want to give as much to people as they can so they can make an informed decision about you. And that leads to better engagements. It paves the way. It keeps you present in the moment, which is a huge piece of the improv experience. And that's what I think I've done better than I ever did because of LinkedIn is create that situational awareness and self-regulation that drives my interactions. Absolutely. And just like the regulation too, because people listening might not know exactly what that looks like. What did that look like for you to really get in tune, allow that transformation to happen? Because it seems like you were very open to it and it just evolved effortlessly, but maybe not so on the back end. But what did that look like for you? I'm exploratory. I'm like Lewis and Clark. I'm like Magellan. I kind of have self-styled through all of this. I am a pioneer, and I don't say that in a braggadocious way. I is one of the first to create a livelihood on LinkedIn, and I did so at a time when no one was outsourcing me for any of the services I came to provide. I had to kind of figure out, what is this? What is the business model around this? Is it strictly educational? But then there's a deliverable. LinkedIn profile writing and design and optimization, helping mm -hmm. people as I helped myself create a presence on the site, drive a footprint. Mm -hmm. And that's where it really clicked for me is when I discovered that I could do this for others. Mm -hmm. I could earn a living doing it, but at the same time, give them greater self-confidence as they explore the site, because not everybody's willing to do what I did. Mm -hmm. And what separates me from anybody else who has yet to achieve a positive result on LinkedIn is commitment because yeah. effective LinkedIn use requires work. It requires time, effort, mm -hmm. discipline, mm -hmm. eyes on screen, critical thinking, all of that. So yeah. uh, my personal feeling was that if I could really show people what I did and how it worked for me, they would follow suit. They would be motivated to take a deeper look at this that incentive and reward system. And if they saw that there was a light at the end of the tunnel, they would walk through that tunnel. Exactly. Leading by example. And I love that. And I'm really curious because I know it wasn't just a straight line. There was maybe some bumps in the road, but what were some of the obstacles you had to overcome while you were figuring out the business model for LinkedIn, how you would make a living off of it? What did that look like? One or two obstacles that you did have to face? Well, it was an entrepreneurial risk that I accepted. <laughs> More of a leap of faith than a natural seamless maneuver. I, I wasn't sure. It was the great unknown for me. And that's mm -hmm. why the pioneering trope is so important for me, because it was like walking over uneven terrain to talk about something that is such an intangible for people. You can't put it in your hand. You can't feel it, taste it. You can't. It, it's a website. What did that what does that inspire people to do? Well, it inspires them to either lean into it and mm -hmm. create something through it or back mm -hmm. off. And mm -hmm. I learned early on that it wasn't for everybody that. Mm -hmm. People were not willing to do what I was going to do. And my role was to basically lead the horses to the water. And if they felt like taking a drink, 
they'd bow down and take a drink. So I open them up to possibilities. That's really the focus of my practice. And like any advisor, Mm -hmm. I look for alignment and fit. It's got to be there. And if I'm going to teach this and give them the type of style counsel that they need to go out there and do what they need to do to produce results, they have to kind of buy in the way that I bought in. I'm living proof that good things happen when you work the site. Absolutely. I I love that you said earlier too, the commitment and discipline to anything. Mm -hmm. I think in order to achieve anything, you have to have that. I know I've had that throughout my life of just, okay, I'm going in all in on this aspect and achieving it because results do happen. Yes, you might have to tweak things along the way, but I'm curious because there's been a lot of success. You've had so much success. What is the success of clients or anything along those lines that you've seen based off of really taking to heart what you're helping them do, helping them navigate that road? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because sometimes I don't know the impact I'm making on my clients and students until they actually come forward and tell me. Because in professional development training, you know, the goal is to give them the steps they need to be self-reliant and then push them out of the nest and let them go out, connect and prosper. And that's Mm -hmm. what I've done. I've had people who want to plug into me for more extended periods of time to measure and track what we're doing. But for the most part, People get the profile that I deliver for them. They get the knowledge, they get the strategy, and then they go out there and ideally they have to connect the dots on their own. So it's all individual outcomes and your mileage may vary, so to speak. But I think that the greatest ROI I can deliver is just a feeling of self-confidence in knowing that you're going to be researched well on LinkedIn and your online version, again, is going to correspond with who you are, what you offer professionally, to a client, customer, or employer and accomplish any number of objectives, whether you want to build a big community, whether you want to grow a podcast, whether you want to be more aligned with media opportunities, media placements, whether you're pivoting. Since the onset of the pandemic, pretty much everyone coming to me right now is in some state of a rebrand or a micro pivot, or they're just, they're making tweaks. They did this, now they want to do this, or they worked for the man for 20 years, Mm -hmm. and now they want to go out and be in business for themselves. That's very true. And I noticed so many people following their passions. Once the pandemic hit, they had this time or really were reflecting on what do I want in my life? And, Mm -hmm. you know, I've pivoted so many times in my entrepreneurial journey, But I think the beautiful thing is being able to reshape that in a fast paced industry, just being online, everything is changing so quickly with the people that do come to you that are really in that pivoted moment where they're like, okay, I've been working for the man for 20 years. I'm ready to switch over to have my own thing. And in that fast paced industry that we are in, how do you see people really being able to pivot successfully after just working somewhere else for so long? Because a lot of people listening might be in that position right now where they're like, I want to start my own thing. I draw back to the pandemic, which I believe has given us greater autonomy Mm -hmm. and has really opened up the eyes of many people who for so long were doing what they had to do. And now they are doing what they want to do or what they feel they were put on the planet to do. And it's mission work for them. They feel that this is what they want to do. We certainly have developed new habits. People love working at home. The notion of the physical office in a hybrid work environment has really changed the whole future of work perception. So I think that you've got more and more people taking liberties, going out there, doing what they want to do, because you might as well succeed in something you love to do. And why not? You have to have passion for what you do. Passion is one of those words that gets thrown around a lot. But people who are truly passionate about their vocations, it's not a side hustle any longer. It has moved to the forefront. That's true. And I think it can be that scary jump for people, but once they really can follow what is aligned with them and they're ready Mm -hmm. to go all in, I think that's when a lot of things start to shift. And I notice now that I'm very aligned with what I'm doing, a lot of doors have opened up that I would have never seen because I was doing too many things. And a lot of times people are really passionate about multiple things. And I think it's okay to be multi-passionate, but really focusing in on one thing, just like for you, for LinkedIn, and now even going further into the psychology, the neuroscience, and bridging everything together. I think it's just continuing to up-level 
in what you already know, you have that solid foundation. And when people take that jump where they're like, I know this, I want this, and being able to really see that through is where change can happen and people can have that success, just like you and all the people that you work with as well. I'll expand on the neuroscience piece just to throw a little, just yeah. a little bit of terminology out there. I think the difference between folks who are just looking at LinkedIn is something they feel they have to do as opposed to folks that are truly extracting value from it. They have their limbic lobes tickled. They're really seeing the emotional and intellectual components kind of come together on this. And they really see that as professionals, we're still human beings. Yeah. We're just around a different type of etiquette and a different type of behavior that is moving us to new heights. In personal social media platforms, you know, look, it's like taking a hit of truth serum on Facebook or the site formerly known as Twitter or whatever other platform. You're getting people that are freely expressing themselves, almost without filters. Yeah. Well, many without filters. But okay. on LinkedIn, there's still that certain gravitas, that political correctness you have to appeal to the limbic system of those you wish to serve. And if you can't or don't, it's going to be very, very tough to move that mountain and that needle. That's true. And just even thinking about how each platform is a little bit different and a lot of them are unfiltered <laughs> where they're mm -hmm. just sharing everything. And I think it's good to share about yourself and be authentic and all of those things that we have spoken about. But there is a certain etiquette with LinkedIn that is a little bit different than the other platforms from my experience. And just even when I first started, when people are like, well, you should be on LinkedIn. I'm like, why? Like, I don't understand. Like, because of what I was doing, I had been in the psychology world moving into coaching, but I see it such as a benefit. I've met so many incredible people on LinkedIn just by being able to connect and learn about their business or what they're doing, even if they're in the corporate world. It's just been amazing to see that. And I feel like you're able to have those authentic connections on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. It's just how it's delivered is a little bit different than the other platforms. Indeed. Well, I'm just really curious because I know you've already accomplished so much. But what is your future aspirations for what you're doing now, where you're going in the next couple years, even next year? Well, that's a great question. I certainly can't predict the future. And good Lord willing, I'll be around to, to kind of execute my plan and my vision. I just kind of like to find more interesting, unique, original, genuine, insert description here, ways to deliver value, share knowledge, make mm -hmm. people feel good about themselves as professionals, do it in interesting ways that nobody in the world is doing. I look and see what a lot of folks are doing. It seems to be very, very rote and very hackneyed, some of the expressions people are using now. And I just, I salmon and I swim the other direction. And I'm always looking for new and original approaches. And I pay attention to what I'm doing and the impact I'm making. And I course correct where necessary. So I want to do more events. I want to do more media. Uh, I want to get on some of the coolest stages in the world and just kind of preserve a legacy of a guy that was there at the start who went a generation in, maybe a generation plus, and set up a few people for their positive futures. I love it. I just got chills. And I think it's because you are a pioneer. You were able to be a pioneer on LinkedIn, but I think it's because you genuinely care about what people are putting out there, how they are showing up, because that's what you do when you embody that and just lead by example for everybody to come. And I think it's just so cool that you don't go the norm. You are a standout in so many ways. And I appreciate that. I so appreciate you even coming on today just to share your story and your journey of how LinkedIn really changed for you, but also everyone around you and continue to find creative ways to make such an impact in all the places you show up. So thank you so much for being on first off, but where can people find you, JD? Well, it shouldn't surprise anyone that I do maintain a LinkedIn account. And I am searchable under my name on LinkedIn, and I'm easy to find. You can find me in all the familiar places wherever you get your social media. Perfect. Well, thank you again, JD, for coming on and just sharing your journey with us. I appreciate it. I know everyone listening does as well. But make sure to like, subscribe, comment below. What was the biggest takeaway from JD today? I'm sure he would love to see that comment, and we'll see you on the next episode.